Uh, well, first of all, welcome. Uh, a very nice afternoon, as opposed to rainy and miserable like we've been having. And as uh, I'd like to welcome all of you, this is a, our monthly series on careers in global development. And it's a real pleasure to today to have Dr. Cindy Wong with us. Welcome. Thank you. And I think you've seen the blurb on, on Cindy. She's had a very interesting career. She's the co-coordinator and senior policy fellow at the Center for Global Development. Uh, before that, she was the Millennium Challenge Corporation as a Deputy Vice President for Policy. Uh, she was also at the State Department in a number of different positions. One is in the, the Bureau for Conflict and Stability Operations, and uh, she also worked for the Counselor and Chief of Staff of the State Department, where we worked together on a Feed the Future initiative a few years ago. Uh, she also worked for MSF. And you did some work in Pakistan, I believe, as well. Yeah. So she's had a, a very interesting career in the foreign policy establishment here in Washington. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has a PhD from Berkeley in anthropology. So she's uh, dabbled around the academic side <laughs> as well. So she has a quite an extraordinary career. And she's going to talk a bit about her work and, and the various positions she's held and has some thoughts on career advice and that sort of thing. So without any further uh, ado, I'll turn it over to Cindy. Over to you. Great. Thank Hi. you so much. Um, it's really lovely to be here. Um, and I, you know, as Bill mentioned, I've worked in a variety of capacities and, and um, pursued both an MPA and a PhD. So I really want to, I'm really looking forward to the, the Q&A portion to hear about what you're most interested in. Uh, so just as a first getting a sense of the room, can you raise your hand if you're in graduate school right now? Okay, how about any undergraduates? Okay, and so people who are, I guess, working or in a full-time internship? Okay, good, so it's a pretty even split. Um, it's, it's helpful to know, and I, I do wanna apologize. I know this was scheduled for a few months back and I had a family emergency, so thanks to all of you who persevered and showed up um, for a second time. So, I, you know, I. In terms of my career, I, there are some questions that I get pretty frequently. You know, one is like, wow, it's, it seems like, I mean, the nice way of putting it, um, or maybe the less diplomatic way of putting it is like, oh, it seems like you've done a bunch of different random things, you know, both, <laughs> so there are different interpretations. And I mean, not to seem too naive or idealistic, but I really, and I think this is, this is part of the career advice I will give, I think it's really important to, you know, assess the landscape, what's happening at any given moment, and find an opportunity that fits the, the growth edges that you're looking to develop. So in my opening remarks, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about the research that I'm doing currently and what I've done in different capacities, but I also wanted to, to just, as a frame, help you think about the kinds of experience that you might want to develop. So one is, you know, um, what was just mentioned in terms of how much do you want to be on the academic side versus the practitioner side. Um, another that people in development often um, think about is what, how much to be on the kind of, there's the softer side of development, there's global health, um, kind of uh, work with refugees that I'm doing now, and the, the harder side. So what I did at the Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, which is interfacing with Department of Defense and you know counter, people working on counterterrorism, and so that's kind of another area. And then another split is on kind of how much do you want to think about serving in government versus NGOs on the outside. And so I feel like I've gotten a flavor of these multiple, and, I, and most of all, I would say, uh, you know, really find a place where you see a good opportunity, but it's really important to, you know, it's often good, and Bill has this too, to have experience from multiple perspectives. Uh, so, you know, I did start out my career after I was an undergrad working at the Human Development Center in Pakistan. And it was a really great experience. It was a local think tank that was started by one of the founders of the Human Development Index, which some of you may have heard about that's published by UNDP every year. And it was a really great experience to be on the ground. I hope many of you have worked abroad already, but that is one thing that you know, over and over you find just invaluable experience. And what I really enjoyed about that experience is that I was working with local researchers. So it was you know, developing relationships, thinking about how to ask questions in a way that's most relevant to the local context. Um, and then I pursued a master's in public administration at the Woodrow Wilson School. And it was a wonderful experience, great training. I mean, I remember thinking, 
and this is what some of you are going through now, like I'm gonna do all this research and then come up with a two-page memo <laughs> that's supposed to go to this, you know, a potential Secretary of State, and like, how can, that's crazy, how can all this information be boiled down? And then when I was later at the State Department, I was like, well, that's really how it works, so it's an invaluable skill. But one of the things that I realized about myself in, in going through those exercises was that like, no, I really do want to get deeper into the, into the local context, into the questions um, that, that you cannot answer in, in two to four pages. Of course, uh, under any two-page mm -hmm. memo, as you know so well, oh, there's a mountain of research. So it's not that it's ill-informed. But I felt like, well, in order to tee up those decisions, I feel I need a deeper training. And one thing, since all of you are here because you're interested in development, I'll be a little bit of an evangelist to say that I still feel that anthropology and sociology hold some of the best tools and the most trenchant critiques of development. And it doesn't mean everyone has to do a PhD, but what I mean by that is when you look at development projects that fail, it's generally not because, you know, oh, if, you know, if only we had chosen this strain of wheat, you know, going back to our food security days, or if only it were that kind of bean, you know, this, this would have definitely lifted millions of people out of poverty. Of course, R&D and science are critical, but often it is about a lack of understanding of the local context and especially the local political economy. And, um, you know, so there, I, I, I do feel, and one of my favorite books on the topic is, um, what called the anti-politics machine by Jim Ferguson, where he looks at a program that's about giving people cattle and livestock, and you know, and why it doesn't work out is ultimately a political economy story of who's benefiting and land ownership. And I think the practitioners in development have gotten much more savvy about it, but I still find it's a, a fundamental core question, um, a, set, a set of skills to ask important questions. And then the second reason why I really have appreciated my training in anthropology is that the one thing I feel like I, um, that you cannot lose sight of, and it's embodied in various development effectiveness principles from Paris to Accra to Busan around country and local ownership. And I think sometimes, um, you know, it seems like, oh, there's, you know, well, we don't want something to get in the way of faster progress, but I can, just cannot emphasize enough that even when it comes to humanitarian response, that that sense of local ownership and capacity is critical. And when you start to move up the ladder, which I'm sure all of you will, you know, it starts to say, okay, well, that's, that's fine, but, you know, I need to show results, or USAID is telling me I need to show results on a two-year or four-year timeline. And yes, we, there are bureaucratic constraints, but ultimately, again, without having to do a PhD in it, I think if you can go back again and again to say kind of what are the local perspectives, what is a sustainable approach, that's just always a helpful question to check yourself. Um, and so I, you know, I also worked for MSF in the meantime, which, is a, which was a great experience. And I think it, it really showed me, I, I've had these more existential moments where I'm like, okay, if it's so hard to do good in the long term, you know, in a real, very long term development project, you know, maybe it's better to just work on humanitarian relief where you're providing immediate benefits to people and you can see the people, it's so tangible in the moment. Um, and I think there's no answer to that. I think it, it's always a balance and you start to see where they, they intersect. Um, and then I guess I'll just, uh, because I do wanna hear from you and what, what questions you're interested in. The last thing I'll say is just on my current research, which, um, so I'm the co-director of the Migration, Displacement, and Humanitarian Policy Program at the Center for Global Development. And it's a really a tough environment to work on refugee and displacement issues, and that's the area that I focus on. We've been doing a lot of research on the economic and fiscal benefits of giving refugees the right to work, a right to education, and you know that evidence base is really strong. It's not just us; it's a whole group of people who are advancing those issues. Um, but you know, you start to see the limits of what strong expert analysis can do given the political environment. And so I think it's, it's, it's a question that we're still asking ourselves of how to, in, in this difficult time where there's not a lot of attention to what the evidence base is, and I'm not just speaking about in the US, but I think there's a broader trend around the world. You know, what's our ability and responsibility to 
also understand how to translate that into impact. And at CGD, we've always felt that responsibility, but I think it's in a more challenging environment. You've got to dig deeper and look harder. And I think part of that is evident, uh, related to evidence because there are new groups of researcher who are looking at, researchers who are looking at questions like, you know, when you communicate with people about refugees, what really leads them to act or feel differently. And there is some promising evidence, for example, that when you tell people the, about the economic contributions refugees make, it does change their perception. Or sometimes if you just tell them the percentage of people in a country that are refugees, you know, people often, or immigrants, they often have an inflated sense of the number, they do adjust. And then there are other interesting studies that show when you kind of prompt people to put themselves in other people's shoes, um, you know, it does act them, uh, lead them to act differently or to perceive the situation differently. So I think there are some promising lines, um, you know, in terms of research that can be done about the impact of evidence and how you communicate it. Um, but I think um, another track that we have to think about is, you know, in order for <coughs> research and evidence to take hold, kind of what are the broader conditions in a society? And it, it's not surprising at all that several years after a major recession, people are looking to scapegoat migrants and immigrants. And one of my colleagues, Michael Clemens, is writing a book that will address some of these issues that, you know, during the Great Depression, it was, you know, eight or so years after that that we had bipartisan support for Chinese exclusion. Um, and, you know, to overcome that, it was a whole series of investments in major institutions like mass education, um, really buttressing our social safety net that led to an environment where change is possible. So I want you all to stick with development studies if that's what you're interested in. Um, but I think it's, it is a call to say that if you want um, kind of the US or whatever country you're from to have a robust evidence-based development program, um, it, it really does take broader civic engagement, which we're all capable and you know, should be called to do. And I think that's a, a question that I also, as I mentioned, am still grappling with of, you know, how do you, knowing that you're just one person, um, but still how do you maximize your impact on these multiple fronts and, and um, you know, make choices and take advantage of opportunities that are out there? Good, great. Um, now we're going to, so I'm going to ask the first question while you think of questions you may want to ask Cindy. If you have a question, please state your name and where you're affiliated with so she knows who she's talking to. I'm going to take advantage of our chat a little bit yeah. before the uh, session began and uh, continue on your refugee work. Could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the Rohingya? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so one of our major projects right now is looking at the latest um, influx of Rohingya refugees to Bangladesh. And it's where CSIS is doing some really interesting work on this topic as well. And one of the main angles, you know, because I'm at the Center for Global Development, and oftentimes people ask, well, why, you know, isn't that more of a humanitarian issue? Mm -hmm. And and this goes back to what I was saying about, you know, there, there are no fine lines because what, we've, what we find is the global average of displacement is 10 years. And I mean, for people who are in situations of protracted displacement, that is five years or more, the average is 20 years. So when you think about that, the model of year-on-year -year humanitarian aid providing food, water, and shelter doesn't really do anyone a great service. Um, and so we're thinking about policy ideas um, from the development perspective to say, you know, how can we, as an international community, offer forms of support that will help both the refugees and the host communities. Because what you find is sometimes there is tension and there have been cases where refugees have higher development outcomes like better nutrition than people in the host community because oftentimes refugees are hosted in more vulnerable or marginal areas of a country. So the ideas we're bringing to the table are, you know, it's, it's not new from a development perspective, but you know, if you are going to diagnose what's needed in this broader area for growth, then you're talking about um, things like, you know, good strong policy environment for um, economic growth. You're talking about you know, how to look at trade and investment, and all the while figuring out, is there an opportunity for, again, not just the host, but the refugees to access some of those opportunities? And that's really led us to our work in terms of focusing on what are the 
kind of the rights and opportunities that are necessary to that. So focusing on education and livelihoods and work for refugees. It's a very, I should say, just in terms of the Bangladesh specific work, it's a, <coughs> it's a very um, tough environment and there's an election at the end of the year. So it's, it's not easy to have this policy space because Bangladesh very rightly wants there to be accountability on the Myanmar side. And you know there is a justified nervousness around if we let people work and, and really make it seem like a medium term solution, then that might take the pressure off of Myanmar. And so I think that's important to highlight because again, as a technocrat, I said, well, I mean, the likelihood mm -hmm. people return is so small. And so we should really focus on these inclusive growth opportunities and these win-wins. Um, at the same time, that's playing in a broader geopolitical uh, set of issues that we really have to be cognizant of and figure out the right ways to communicate our policy messages and uh, the right timing to do so. Yep. OK, if you have any questions, now is the time. Ah, go ahead, please. Hearing a lot of different things. Oh, sorry. I've been hearing a lot of different things about what I should do next for graduate school and wanted to learn your recommendations on maybe a law degree versus pursuing a master's in the more academic side. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just follow up and ask um, just your tentative answer kind of do you have a sense of ideally five or ten years from now what kind of not what organization you would be working at but what kind of place and what kind of role you might have um, I was thinking of both the end or the development world or perhaps the intelligence community mm -hmm. with an approach either with arbitration or defense policy okay and I'm wondering if a legal degree would serve me best or whether a master's would say national security or Sociology or more development based. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, this is a very uh, common question. And just to say that I was in your shoes in the sense that, well, what, it was a little bit later, I was um, thinking about. Well, I'd actually applied for law school before going to get my master's. And, uh, and so I, I was kind of weighing the, the same. And I think ultimately, uh, the advice, and my husband's a lawyer, so I've heard, and he never really practiced law. So, I, I mean, the, the advice that I give is that, um, you know, either can provide a very rigorous training. I think the kind of the cost and investment of law school, if you know that you don't want to be a practicing lawyer, which one can be a practicing lawyer in the intelligence community, or, you know, so it, it does not, I'm not saying if you don't want to go work at a law firm, don't go, but I do think there's a, there are a lot of great options out there, and so I feel unless you think there's a somewhat high probability that um, you know you know you want to be a practicing lawyer at some point in some way, I think it's good to just ask really hard questions. Of course, I wouldn't tell you to choose one or the other, but I just think that's a really um, that is a really important question to answer for yourself. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, right, we'll go here first, and then we'll work that way. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Alicia. Uh, I'm a first year graduate student from the George Washington University. And I'm in uh, international development studies right now. Thank you very much for your sharing. And I have two questions. Um, as a first year graduate student, uh, we are supposed to choose one specialization. Mm. And in our curriculum, we have so many specializations like economic development, global health, and humanitarian assistance. I feel like I'm interested in everything. And my background is I worked in Africa as a journalist. So I think yeah. that's kind of my nature to be interested in everything. But I have to choose one specific uh, area. And I think to think about that will help help me to develop a career in the future. But um, so my question is, uh, when you chose what you want to study, do you think about whether the courses uh, are practical or you just choose based on your self-interest? Mm. And my second question is, uh, we've read a lot of books, like the books, um, they kind of criticize the current approaches we're using in development projects. It's like we focus too much on the economic side. Mm. and. Um, so I feel like things are getting gloomy and there is no hope. 
So, um, but but uh, we also know that researchers are doing so many works, and we're not short of good approaches and, yeah. or good methods to change the world or change okay. the situation. So as a researcher, do you think um, scholars or researchers have enough impact to mm. uh, challenge or have enough influence on policymakers? Mm. Thank That's you. That's a good, good question. So, um, yeah, really good question in terms of how do you pick a specific, you know, area of study to go into. So, you know, again, at the risk of sounding a little bit naive, um, you know, I, I do think that you will do best in what you're most interested in. And for people who are interested in multiple topics, and one thing that I found, it goes to what I was saying in terms of, you know, how much academic, how much practitioner, I find that, you know, ultimately, even though I did do a PhD, like, ultimately, I'm also a generalist, you know, that I think that it's, you know, I'm very interested in refugees now, but I only started really doing a deep dive on that work two or three years ago. And I'm also very interested in women's equality and empowerment programs. And so I, so I think for people who are not, and on the other hand, I meet students who say, you know, I've always wanted to study, you know, the dynamics of famine and what are the mechanisms we can use to prevent famine and, and so some people are really focused I think for people who are more generalist in nature that it really is more about the skill set that you're developing in terms of the kind of analysis you know can you quickly analyze a problem and you know provide recommendations and assess the situation understand the political economy and I think for that it's okay to pick because you do have to specialize to some degree I think it's okay to pick what you're most interested in, in at the time with an eye to say well where I want, you know, my growth areas are um, not necessarily reading the 100 books published on this topic, but really, you know, getting in, in situations like doing internships and, you know, like doing case studies where you can really exercise that skill set. And I, and I do find that that's, you know, it becomes pretty clear at people's CVs, you know, if they're, if they're more, a little bit more on the functional side looking across or more, you know, interested in one topic. So, I, you know, I wouldn't, and I, I know it, it, it's, pro, it's a, can be a tough job market out there. I will say that all of you having selected development, which is, you know, there is a lot of <laughs> job opportunity. I already get the sense that you're not people who are trying to maximize income. <laughs> Maybe there are a few of you out there, but probably not. And so I think for this group of people, it very much is, you know, you will invest more energy in a topic that you're more interested in at the moment. But I do feel it's important to know that you're not boxed in by that. You know, just because you focus on humanitarian doesn't mean that you couldn't do civ mill relations in the future. Um, to your second question on, I think there were a couple parts to your question on whether or not researchers are having enough impact. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's the answer. I I think is no because that's my bias of saying you know that there is there is evidence about what works. Um, and but at the same time, I would say kind of what I was saying about the broader global environment is that I actually think it's also on the researchers to understand the environment that they're putting their research into and I, and I do feel like that's on the on researchers where there is a lot around communications where you know we don't have to be the specialists in although you were a journalist so you you really know that area but but I do think it's you know it's partly on us as researchers too can I like how do you effectively communicate and build the network so that your ideas get out there and I try not to be too glum about the current state of affairs because as I said there's a whole area of research around how social change happens you know maybe not be what more technocratic development people have focused on but there are whole areas and departments of USAID that oh, focus yeah. on governance and rule of law and how democratic change happens and how it sticks so I think you know I think we are probably in this time of rebalancing where you know so I'm at a think tank where probably 75 percent or more of the researchers are economists and that has been a dominant form of thinking. And I actually enjoy it as a challenge of saying, you know, how do we meld that thinking with other modes like in sociology, political economy, to, to get to solutions that don't rely only on technocratic prowess, but are also built on understanding who the constituencies are and how it fits into a longer process of potential change, potential, hopefully, in a positive direction. Here. Yeah. 
Uh, hi, I'm Mace from the Netherlands. I study just around the corner here at Johns Hopkins Science and I intern at the UN Development Programme. Thank you for coming here and sharing your experiences. Uh, you've had a, quite a wide-ranging career within development and I'm curious whether you could perhaps reflect a bit on the differences between working for NGOs per se and the government yeah. and perhaps if you feel comfortable doing so, development yeah. consultancy as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, and I would say my, <laughs> uh, working in, in, in government, you know, it does depend on which government is in power, <laughs> partly. <laughs> no, I mean, the, this current administration, of course, has been quite tough on, on, on development in terms of wanting to reduce the budget, et cetera. Um, so I have really appreciated having um, experience from both sides because while the art of anthropology is trying to put yourself in someone's shoes without having to actually be in their shoes. <clears throat> Nothing replaces having the experience of, you know, it, it really, it ranges from very small things to, you know, well, how are decisions really made? And I think that's where it's really helped inform that on the NGO or researcher side, where you can say, okay, well, I, I do understand how where there are points of intervention or engagement that are more effective you know because i was on on the other side in government mm -hmm. at one point and the other reason i have really enjoyed working on both sides is that um, things you know so msf doctors without borders is majority from private individual funding and you know and that and that gives you a certain leeway, whereas on the other side, you know, funding from state or USAID, there are all these bureaucratic procedures, and there's a reason for all of it, but to understand kind of where constraints exist and where they don't, I think also helps you understand the landscape. Um, I, you know, in terms of, I, I do encourage, I think one great thing about being in school is that you can do multiple internships, so I think it's good to, to get experience from different perspectives. I would say I don't, it's not that I like one or the other better, but I think the power of government um, it is that when it can be harnessed to do good, the level, the scale that you can reach is really difficult to replicate in the NGO sector. Now, I just came back from Bangladesh and was like an NGO like BRAC, which mm -hmm. <laughs> proves that it's not a strict rule. But I, I do think there's, you know, and I'm, so I am a big believer in good government, and I think it's a privilege to have served the government. So it is something that I encourage people to do. And when I was at the Woodrow Wilson School, uh, this has been in the news, so it's nothing, um, it, it's, it's no secret, but there was a discussion um, in terms of, you know, oh, are too many people, has this trend swung too far in terms of people interpreting public service, mostly as being in the NGO sector, you know, not seeing government service as a part of that. And it was um, some discussion about the, one of, one of the gifts that had been given to the Woodrow Wilson School. Um, and, and, all, and, and, I, and that's just a small example to say that, that you do see trends back and forth. And when I look at today's challenges, and it is, I think, a, a call to like we really need good people in government, um, and it's and you can't, you know, I, you can't be a purist in some sense. But then what I lear wor learned working in NGOs is that you can't be a purist there either. So you know there are different kinds of compromises that you make. But I would put in a plug for you know again when harnessed um, in a in a manner with integrity and for the greater good, there's you know really nothing that compare, can compare in terms of scale and norm setting of working in government. Right, your next row. Yeah. Hello, uh, I'm Zainab Bayar. Uh, I have uh, recently graduated from the City University of New York uh, Graduate Center. Um, as you uh, stated before, you uh, studied on uh, policy, uh, sorry, public uh, policy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also anthropology. Um, I have, I think, a similar uh, background uh, with you, and I would like to ask a question about the different areas that you worked. And I, I also uh, studied international relations uh, in my uh, undergrad, and also studied uh, political science in my uh, graduate study. And during my uh, as a minor, I also studied uh, gender equality mm. and also human rights. And I wrote my thesis about that. So when I apply to to make some uh, do some applications uh, for job, like usually I get some uh, feedbacks and uh, like uh, 
if you studied on uh, uh, politics or a gender equality, as you also uh, also research on a gender equality, so um, you should uh, work in a, a governmental uh, organization or, or or government. So do you have the same idea about that? I don't know how to to answer uh, that question because in order to understand also international uh, development project, you also know the the circumstances of the the, the country, policy of the country, yeah, yeah. and the history of the country. Yeah. So I don't know how to deal with these problems so that I'm. Face that I have difficulties with this yeah. uh, issue now. Yeah, and so, so you feel like that's the response you're getting when you're applying to non government? Like jobs. some supranational organizations, like when I uh, want to involve to the, the project, development projects, so I get a feedback like if you study like political science and international relations, so yeah. you should work in a governmental yeah. organization. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry to hear that because I feel that's very short-sighted of a response because, you know, as we were discussing earlier, I think it is that you need that full set of skills. Um, so, I, I mean, so maybe I might respond with just a more practical piece of advice for you to take or leave, but I do find that, you know, just because we all, when you apply for a job, you're usually applying to many, that sometimes it's a lot of effort to kind of redo everything and reprioritize kind of the different areas you've studied for each job, but I do feel that's really essential because I think, you know, it, it you did study what you study, but I think there are ways of writing a cover letter or organizing a resume to really kind of you know, really lift up other parts that this particular hiring official may be pay paying closer attention to. But I do think it's like also in the interview process to, to make the case about how the skill set is, is useful and how you, you know, seeing projects succeed or fail based on some of this more contextual, historical, political economy understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hello, um, my name is Amanda Jarrett. I am a junior at Michigan State University working on the Hill right now as an intern. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate about your experience in Pakistan as well as any advice that you could give me or anyone else who is interested in doing the Peace Corps and the valuable experience of having international um, yes. work experience and like really being able to be put into the cultural realm of what for me I'm personally trying to study. Um, yeah, I do think it's really essential, and of course some people have very successful careers in development without um, living abroad, but I do think it's both from the perspective of understanding, you know, being really embedded in a place where you're working to advance a specific <coughs> cause or outcome, and then I think there's this other benefit of understanding the specific culture of development and how it operates in the field, because it is, a, there are you know dynamics to be aware of and just figuring out you know how does the development bureaucracy you know work with the host government include the host government to achieve more sustainable outcomes so my experience um, in Pakistan with the human development center now called the Mabubal Haq human development center was a around working on there they did a, a regional South Asia human development report every year and it was the issue on gender equality so it was a topic that's very close to my heart and it um, you know and it was just to, to say that it's kind of a daunting thing like I graduated from college got connected with this opportunity and I was like okay and then I'm gonna move to Pakistan and it's you know that's not a simple or easy thing uh, although maybe for all of you you've lived around the world but um, so I just wanted to name that also because I think it's it's important to recognize that that's a really big transition, and it was a, it was a great experience kind of, of working with as I said these local researchers and and really understanding their perspectives and and at the same time having this connection to the broader global development dialogue which is kind of the the global human development report, so it it was a very positive. Experience and then after that, with Doctors Without Borders, I um, mostly did work in other countries. So I was in Kenya working on an HIV/AIDS program, and then I did I was doing that for a year, and then I did shorter 
um, stints working in South Sudan, in Nigeria on a meningitis vaccination campaign, and then in China after the earthquake in Beichuan. So, uh, you know, so it's kind of, uh, and, I, and I do think, again, that that's, it's an invaluable experience. So to the Peace Corps, I strongly recommend the Peace Corps. I do. And I mean, yes, you can read snarky blog posts about, <laughs> I don't know if you've read them, you know, there are some snarky blog posts out there saying, oh, this is more like tourism, or what does this person really, you know, add, and because, you, you know, you're not enough of an expert yet. And I, I do not, um, I do not assess the Peace Corps in that way because everyone has to get their experience somewhere. And it, I think as long as you go into the experience with the appropriate humility, which should be a large amount of humility, that's the appropriate level. And, and I feel the same way about myself having worked in development for 20 years. Like, as long as it's approached with humility and understanding of your limitations and a real desire to connect and learn, I think the Peace Corps is a really beautiful experience that can be the foundation for getting to know other local NGOs where you can apply for jobs, et cetera. And, um, and I think, and, and I know the Peace Corps has now also expanded the program where they have you know uh, older professionals who go into it. So it is, it's a diversified model now, but I highly encourage it. It's a, a way to go out. I mean, I will say from my early experiences that you know some other programs, I think, prepare people less. Yet there's not as much training or a network. Again, I'm sure the Peace Corps could do more too, but in a lot of other places there would be even less so I, I think it's an excellent program that you know that everyone should at least consider applying to especially if that is one avenue for you to get significant international experience if I could just reinforce that from the Foreign Service and from working for NGOs it's really expensive to put people overseas yes. as a practical matter and so if this is the person's first experience overseas yes. and they find out they don't like it mm -hmm. It costs a bundle to move folks back home again uh, and deal with the problems they've probably created. Yeah. So I think it's really important to, to, if you can, to get overseas experience so yeah. that as you're applying, yeah. the organization knows you understand what you're getting into. Maybe not the specifics, right. but in general, how to live and, and, and operate in an overseas environment. Yeah, I just have to add one thing on this because I, because my, um, after being in Pakistan, my, my first post with MSF, I had this very tough Liberian recruiter who had been through it all. She had been the head of programs, worked in refugee crises, and she looked at me and she said, okay, well, you're coming to me with your fancy CV. You went to Yale and Princeton and whatever, you know, like, so look at me and say that you are gonna go work in Kenya, work on admin and finance, mm -hmm. And you are going to, yeah, approach it with the appropriate humility and that you, you're going to stick with it. You know, it's not going to be this highfalutin policy where you're, you know, yeah. there with the, the ambassador talking about policy. So, like, and, and it was this great, you know, shock to the system of, like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, when you get started, it is. I was doing, and I was not, I'm not really good at spreadsheets, to be honest, but, you know, I stuck with it. Like, how do you hire people? How do you follow local regulations? And, and we all should be willing to do that to understand development yeah. and humanitarian <clears throat> relief as it happens. Yeah. Over here. Hi, uh, I'm Dave Johnson, a first-year law and master's student at American University. Um, my question is more to your experience. Uh, what do you think we as a country need to do to, um, or not need to do, to prevent over-reliance on the Department of Defense and uh, stabilization operations and development? Yes, that's, um, that was a lot of the, the reason for the creation of this Department of Conflict and Stabilization Operations. Now that was building on the experience of um, a secretary level office of um, crisis response and stabilization. I don't remember what CRS exactly what it stood for, um, which I should yeah. know. But um, it, so, you know, I do think this is a decades uh, long project for us to kind of to, to shift. And it's, there are a lot of entrenched equities and it's you know it can appear that the results of military action 
or even um, military-led reconstruction and stabilization are, you know, you kind of get results quicker, but I think the, the lessons of the past 10 or 15 years are that you really do need a strong civilian capacity. And what do I think can be done about that? Um, you know, I, I do, you know, being at State, there were many lessons learned papers. And, you know, so I think on the research side, that's only one component. And I honestly think a lot of good work has been done on that. Um, I, I think that it's, uh, there is a lot of, you know, there's this natural imbalance just because, you know, people will always joke, you know, that the marching band has more employees than the entire, you know, State Department, the military marching band will have more employees than the, the entire, at least just State Department, maybe also USAID mm -hmm. capacity on this front. So, you know, I, I, think I, I think one does have to take a longer view of it, and I do say, again, kind of, it's on our own shoulders. Those who feel that the civilian capacity needs to be increased, it's kind of, it's on us to really build that constituency and to take opportunities to, um, you know, where there is space to show success. And I think that can be done also very effectively, not only thinking about the U.S. alone, but, you know, how do, for, for example, the um, some of the work, the civilian-led work that's been done around UN peacekeeping has been very effective. So, you know, kind of, and, and I guess that's the last thing I would say. You know, so there's, there's how do you build a constituency? How do we work more with people on the Hill? But then there's also the kind of, I think one frame shift that would be very helpful is to not pause it as an either or. And of course, there are a lot of smart people who have said that before, that it's really about the partnership. But how do you build up the comparative advantages of the civilian side? Again, it may have to start at a smaller scale and, and really find ways to effectively partner. I think a great example of that, one of my colleagues now at CGD used to run um, OFTA um, where mm -hmm. you also led the charge at one point, the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and where we see humanitarian and military collaboration is, is very effective. So I mean, we should look at what works about that and, you know, and really try to scale it up. And we were just having a conversation the other day about how you know, some of them are not the sexy things and we've tried and failed in other contexts, but just kind of what's that constant exposure, joint problem solving, and really asking Congress and the American people to invest in that before it's needed in the stabilization period. Yeah. And that's the kind of, I think, I don't want to say campaign, but kind of campaign mentality of how do you keep engaging around those questions so that when the next crisis comes, that partnership and capacity on the civilian side already exists. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That, just one second. Hi. Um, my name is Megan. I'm interning at the UN Foundation. Um, I do plan on getting my master's in international affairs within the next few years. Mm. Um, so I just wanted to know, um, from your point of view, how do I make the most out of my time uh, between the period between undergrad and graduate school, um, whether it be internships and you know, hopefully getting a job or yeah. overseas and things like that? Great. Well, yes, I will return to the try to get overseas if you can, if you want to stay focused on development. I think that's that's so useful and in many for many jobs also a necessary step. I also think it's good. I, you know, one of my regrets in my career is that I did not work more before getting a master's. You know, I just remember at one point, you know, my my very I don't think they would be offended if I said that my very classic Chinese parents being like, when are you going to be done with school? You know, and I was like, okay, I think that's a sign. <laughs> um, so, um, so I do think that, the, you know, kind of it's, it's great that you're interning now, but I think now is the time. I do find that people who worked more before going to do their master's work, they just got a lot more out of the experience, you know, and they were, they were treating it much less in terms of the same routine you were in as an undergrad of like, okay, take the test, do the papers. They, they had a much better sense of like, okay, no, this is the practical set of problems that I faced while working, and here were the tools that I you know, I was missing, you know, and it might be more economic analysis or it might be more, you know, writing in a clear, compelling way, it might be communications around policy ideas. So I, I would think about doing, you know, doing a significant chunk of time working and, and thinking of, and using it as a time to explore some of the questions that are 
kind of not dichotomies, but different approaches. So yeah, how much do you want to do more academic type work versus not? And so it's, I think it is helpful to do different internships or jobs that are different. You know, how much do you enjoy more of the programmatic and management side versus not? And and I and I think exploring that and working, you know, not in too many places, because I, I know I, this is probably a mischaracterization of millennials that they move around too much. But I would say, you know, there's a balance of, you know, being in a place where you really get the experience and have added value, and not just doing one thing before going to graduate school. But yeah, again, underscoring, if even if you if you don't have the opportunity to to go live and work abroad for whatever reason. And I know people do face constraints. You know, they might have a parent who is sick or, you know, things that are outside of their control. One way that, one thing that I've, I've found is very valuable for new professionals is then in that case, you might target um, less of a general global research kind of position and more think about doing something that's supporting a program that is overseas. Because then I find people in that situation can get more of the nuts and bolts and have very, I mean, daily, they, they might have the opportunity to visit the program in the field, but also just have more of the day-to-day -day interaction with the field program. So that there are ways to get a sense of what's happening in the field, even if you're not able to live and work abroad. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kiersey, and I'm a graduate student at Syracuse University. And thank you for your presentation. You seem really excited about your work and sharing with us, so it motivates me more to be in the field. Um, my question is, what practices in development have you observed to be changing um, uh, in your career? Um, I'm writing a thesis, and I've observed that there's a lot of um, collaboration with civil society. So like, what, what are some of those things that you've observed that we should be looking into when we move into our career? Thank you. So there are a, a, you know, a variety of big picture trends that I think are happening. What might be um, one thing that I think is relevant, I mean, I do think what you cited as kind of working in partnerships, and I think it's really something that's good to dig into because on one level it can be kind of a platitude like oh well everyone let's get together and try to act but I think when you really um, dig deeper into what makes a partnership or a collaboration effective especially across different sectors I think you can uncover a lot of interesting um, interesting new ideas and trends and so one example of that is collaboration with the private sector or private sector models around social enterprises. So you do see this growth in um, in investment in programs. There's a great one in East Africa, Solar Sisters, which you know it's it started with a lot of grant type investments, but it's you know giving people little like little solar units where electricity is such a challenge and you know allowing them to pay as you go through a mobile phone you know and I, and I don't want to say like that's not you know something like that is not going to solve closing civil society space right so that's, you know so so I think but but it's a really interesting way to look at new models and innovation and so what I would say and I think this is the next stage of partnerships is really articulating you know what are these new models whether they're from the private sector or from movements you know and and what problems do those really map to? Because I think you do get into the skepticism. One of the program, one of the fellows at CGD is working on blockchain. And you know, he had like, you know, I think probably two times a day someone asks him like, can blockchain solve this? And he's and there's this funny decision tree where it's like, you know, 90% of the time, 99% of the time the answer is no. So I think people do get kind of off on trends a little bit too much, but I think but there is an appropriate place for those kinds of models. And another related area that I have been very excited by is the the focus on working across sectors. Now I think that's that's a topic that's very old in some sense, but again I think a more focused look at you know it, it does go back to this class. I think things it's less that things develop and then they're just these waves and you see some trends come back, but just you know, really understanding that when people in development, organizations in development are trying to provide services, it's like two people who are accessing multiple services. Um, and so how do you really program effectively around that? And, and I do think one trend that, I don't know if this is changing, but I hope it is. I mean, I would be the first to say that the the, the large investments in global health have yielded 
so much. And the approach that the Gates Foundations and PEPFAR and others have taken um, have changed the world and saved millions of lives. And there's just no question about that. At the same time, when you go back to this issue of like what kinds of solutions can map on to what solving what types of problems, you do get more of a kind of a a technocratic expert R&D approach to development. And I think there are some foundations now who are saying, okay, well, that was effective and we should continue to pursue that. But, oh wait, those, you know, things like closing civil society space that, 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 are, that can be an existential threat to those NGOs working on health even being in a country. <laughs> you know, so, so I yeah. think that how do you balance that I think we, we are starting to see a rebalance, partly because of some very sobering things happening in the world. And I think that's something to keep an eye on. And I have been part of writing papers on, OK, we have to be more focused on outcomes. And, and I do, th and of course, that's true. We should be focused on outcomes. But I really do think that there's a danger to saying, you know, the, the look feel of saving someone by providing ARVs is something very tangible. But the things that we cherish quite dearly, like uh, a robust civil society like democratic governance, you know, those things are more difficult to measure. So how do we ask critical questions around that? And I do believe, I, I say as an aspiration, that funders who are looking into these questions are also asking themselves hard questions. Um, hi, I'm Carmen. I'm an intern here at CSIS. Thank you for joining us. Um, I really like the point that you made about humility and about going overseas. Um, and I was just wondering, for people who are maybe starting their careers in international development from the US or in their home countries, international organizations and NGOs and the like, what advice would you give them to cultivate humility and to get a better understanding of maybe the communities that they're working with overseas if they can't go there themselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great question. So, okay, I'm going to start with an, an unconventional and quirky answer so you can laugh at it, <laughs> which is um, I think that some kind of mindfulness meditation is very helpful. And I'm not saying this from a, a religious point of view or anything, but just I've found mindfulness meditation for me just like kind of taking, um, taking it's a way to um, take a step back and like really be in tune with how you understand the world and relate to the world outside of the very busy and highly capable rational minds that you all have. So that's the kind of off the bean path answer and a recommendation to all of you. Um, and, and, but beyond that, I do think it is around, you know, nothing replaces a human inter, oh, wait, so the, the one thing that's related to that and uh, <clears throat> less wacky um, or quirky is around deep listening. And, and actually, so mindfulness is a good way to get into deep listening. So you may find that when you're in class and you're, there's a lecture and you know Q&A is coming up and like you're kind of listening to the lecture, but you're also like, oh my gosh, should I ask this question? Is it a good question? Will this person who I really admire think I'm smart when I ask it? Am I gonna frame it in the right way? And so it's like there's this whole track in your mind and that can often get in the way, and that happens in everyday conversations too, and that can really get in the way of deep listening. And that, I do believe, is the most important skill when you're trying to approach a situation, not from, oh, I read this in a book, or I know, but I'm really trying to understand. And that has to be triangulated. So I think if you, if you can't live and work abroad, there are plenty of opportunities to listen to people, both virtually, um, in your person-to-person -person interactions, to get connected to different networks through social media. So I think there's a, there's a whole range of opportunities. But what I fear is that we have all of those opportunities, but minus the deep listening part. <laughs> and, the, and I think that's, that's a real challenge. I don't know if it's more or less than you know today, now that there's internet and social media, but it, it's definitely a perpetual challenge. And, and what I find is that it is hard, it's exhausting. You know, when, when I went to Bangladesh recently, we probably met with, I don't know, maybe 75 people, and it's hard to maintain, and there's the time zone difference and all that. So um, I, I think 
that it, it's really important not only to do that deep listening, but then also to triangulate. And that's where I think the new, uh, not new, but the focus on saying, you know, we need to hear multiple voices. And I'll give you an example from the own, my own field right now in working with refugees. You know, there are a million declarations saying, oh yeah, all of this important, how do you work effectively? Plus, you really have to put refugees, you know, the people we're actually trying to help, you really have to put them in the center and listen to them. And it seems so basic, and you will just not imagine the number of times that a program has been designed and refugees haven't been consulted. And sometimes I hear people say, well, Oh, it's so complicated because you know, refugees are not one group. There are different, you know, there are the men and the women and people who were better off in Myanmar and those who weren't and people who are part of a more organized group. And I, and I, and I, and I understand that. It's very complicated, but not engaging in that messiness and trying to listen more to multiple perspectives, never taking one as the truth, like that then you know for sure that your program is not going to be sustainable. You know? So I, I think there are some of these basic practices that go from you know, kind of when you're just starting out to if you're the head of a major, large UN or other international organization, that that constant remains. And I'm telling you, it gets harder and harder. I have two kids. They're three and five. So I, it's hard for me to go to Bangladesh for longer than 10 days because I don't want to be away from them for very long. And so it's like there, you do have to have trade-offs, but that's why I do appreciate my training of even though it's hard, it's definitely not as hard as for the Rohingya refugees. So we can all be clear about that. But you know that's why it's good to keep you know to say you know there might be technology, there might be all sorts of innovations in the field, but there's a set of core questions around development about who are we doing this for, you know why, how are we holding ourselves accountable that don't change if you are an intern, you know again all the way to the head of USAID. Mm -hmm. Okay, this will be the final question. Um, and Cindy's going to be around for a little yeah. bit afterwards if you want to talk to her directly. But I'm mindful of everybody else's time. So the final question. Hi, my name is Shabnam Kabir. I'm an undergraduate student at the George Washington University. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the role of development in countering violent extremism. Thank you. I, well. The first is a big caveat that, that that's not my area of specialty. So I know that there are really fantastic programs, for example, at USIP, where you have a whole group of incredibly smart people working on it. I, I will say, and again, related to my Bangladesh, but also the experience, because the previous reports that I've done are on Jordan and Lebanon, you know, where there, there is a concern about radicalization and violent extremism. Um, so I. I, I think it's an evidence base that needs to grow. So I, as you know, as as far as I'm aware, there's you know it, it's it is just a, it's highly mediated relationships between going from something like here is someone who is young, whether a refugee or not, just you know here is someone who is young who doesn't have a job opportunity to being radicalized. And there's some very good reports that say, you know, it's a, it's a whole series of both contextual and then individual factors and network factors that, you know, show the way. The, the one finding that I'm familiar with that is pretty consistent is that, you know, that, that governance and the feeling of being excluded and disempowered is a really important factor. So it goes a little bit back to what I was saying of, you know, if you have the broadest view of development, which I think is important. We're seeing this a lot in some of the discussions also around migration, where people take development you know, to be about just the economic development part. So I think when you take development in its fullest glory, let's say, um, and you are seriously looking at questions around power relations, exclusion, um, you know, kind of marginalization that's systemic, you know, then I think there is, a, as far as I understand the evidence, a, a very strong relationship. Now, having been in government, I was kind of leaving at the time that a large initiative around preventing violent extremism was starting. I think, um, and as, as far as I know, it, I don't know how successful it was, but you know, it, it had a lot of high level support and energy. I guess the one final thing I would offer as you embark on your very long and and successful careers is that 
you know, sometimes windows of opportunity do open. And so you'll often see this when it comes to crisis, you know, like there was Ebola and now there's a huge, I don't want, probably not enough funding still, but a lot of interest in global health security, you know, and, and that goes beyond just Ebola or that. So you'll see these, these ebbs and flows um, or we, the food price crisis. Yeah and the launch of Feed the Future, you know, which was an initial commitment of $3.5 billion that we worked on setting up, but then you know, it expanded and, and now has an annual appropriations. My mm -hmm. advice on this is, and, and this has happened with violent extremism too, where you know, you see, you've seen some big jumps in financing, is that that's not, you know, that's not a bad thing. Of course, as a technocrat, I might say, well, there's a lot of evidence for this kind of intervention, and it's, there's just no window of opportunity. I learned so much from the people um, who we collaborated with at USAID on like people who have been working steadily on food security, yeah. and then when they saw the opportunity, they had the evidence and the networks, and they had been investing in the R&D and in local organizations for a long time. And I think this is an area where you know, it, it, it is a kind of a political skill that I think everyone should cultivate is like how do you, if you have an issue that you're working on, or if you're someone benefiting from a large pot of funds that was unpredicted, you know, how do you balance the kind of the political nature that need to have announcements for high level officials with really being grounded in the evidence? And I think that's um, a, a, just something that I've seen that, it's, it's a skill that's very valuable to, to be able to harness those and to not be, of course, on either extreme to say, well, I'm going to do it, you know, or I don't want this extra funding. Not that people would say that, but, you know, I, I'm going to just stay focused on my approach and not engage on the more political issues of the day or to just say, you know, it's not really be anchored in, in the evidence. And I think there's a lot of good that can be done by taking advantage of those windows of opportunity. Great. Thank you very much. I think this has been a very interesting and, and fruitful discussion. And please uh, join me in thanking Cindy for being well, here. Thanks, all of you. Thank you.